Stefano Zacchiaroli, Nicola, Nicola Dandemont Nicola. here. Uh, so the talk is going to be in English. We also speak French, so feel free to interrupt at any time with questions in English or French, or even if Italian, if you want, <laughs> from my case. Um, so the talk is going to be about Software Heritage, which is an archival project. And we're going to present both the project itself and what it has to do with Python and with Python source code specifically. Uh, so first of all, I've been doing uh, free software and open source for almost 20 years now. And I'm, it's kind of fair to say that these days, luckily, we have a little bit at least of free software in every product we use. Software, hardware, there is some free software in there. It's not entirely free software, that's a shame for me. But it's, it's, it's really something that in every IT product you can buy on the market, you is go you're going to find some lines of free software in there. And we usually think about that piece of free software that we all collectively publish and develop together as something which is quite functional. So we usually think at free software as something that it's made, and software in general, to make a computer do something for you. Be a, play a game, drive some machines, something, whatever you can imagine. But so what, we, what is important here and I want to highlight today is that in free software, and specifically in source code, which is what free software allows you to see, modify, share, and so on and so forth, there is also a knowledge part. So in every bit of, of source code that you can see and read, you have some information there which might be very important, which might be very novel. And I have a couple of examples here. So one example is from the source code of Quake, the game. And one example is a snippet from the, uh, from the network queue stack in Linux. And in, it's not, they're not full snippets. But what I'm going to say about these snippets is that they were very novel. And they presented novel techniques that was not known before at the time. For instance, in Quake 3, you find some uh, ways of rendering 3D, um, uh, 3D images, which was entirely novel at the time, something which had might been presented as a uh, computer science conference on 3D rendering. And in the network queue stack of Linux, you can find heuristics for actually deliver uh, package, packages, network packages with very high, th uh, very high throughput, which was not known at the time. So pretty much as we cherish novel discoveries in uh, scientific conferences, we need to understand that we might have the same level of novelty and of knowledge in source code itself. So even if you do not run, software or source code on a machine, it might be valuable to actually know that that piece of code exists, actually go read it and learn something from it. Another example, if you want, is you know, the, uh, the, uh, the scenario in which maybe we can be the first generation which will no longer have any pictures of their kids 50 years from now, because maybe we are storing pictures in formats that are proprietary, and we will not know how to decode them uh, 100 years or 50 years from now. Well, if you have a piece of code that is able to uh, decode and parse and render those images, well, even if you do not, do not have anything else, like a specification, well, there is value. There is knowledge in there that can tell you, that can tell someone down the line how to read those images. So essentially, the point I'm making here is that we are collectively developing a new kind of commons, which didn't exist like 100 years uh, in the past. Okay? So every time we publish, we publish a line of code publicly under a free license, we are collectively contributing to a piece of knowledge which is here and which is here to last. It's not something that people that do not know programming know how to exploit, but it's something that people that do know programming and people that can learn programming will be able to use in the future. Okay? And there are a couple of interesting definitions that you can look up, but essentially this thing is being called the software commons. So essentially it's a collective good which tech people and developers are creating together every time they do a git push or every time they publish a, a, a source package somewhere are collectively creating together. So if we agree that this is something important, the question is, are we taking good care of these software commons. Pretty much as we care about you know, cherishing and, uh, uh, and, and take, keeping into shape sparks or airs or ecology or that kind of stuff, we need to care about this, this new kind of commons. And there are reasons to be concerned. Okay? First of all, if this is a shared resource, if it is a commons that humanity and in particular tech people can access and should be able to, to benefit from, where is the place where you can go and actually do something with this collective body of knowledge? Where is the place where you can search all the libraries, all the programs that you care about? Well, OK, there is GitHub, but not all the source code is there. And we have seen forges you know, come and go over, over time. 
pretty much periodically every 10 or 15 years. So not all the source code that has been published and will be published in the future is on GitHub. Okay? So if you want a single place where you can browse and look for something which has been published as source code, well, today you don't have this place. And even more so, periodically we have seen places that are used to collectively develop source code and to publish source code disappear for various reasons. We have been some commercial hosting services that have been destroyed by attacks. Uh, it's been a case of a uh, fairly small uh, code hosting service which is called, was used to be called Code Spaces. We have seen entirely natural business decision which have brought to the shutdown of forges that were popular at the time. I was very excited when Gitorius was first announced because it was the, uh, the, the free version of, of GitHub, but then it just completely disappears because it's been bought by, by GitHub. And essentially when it has been bought, the time frame left to actually still do something with your code was actually pretty small. And Google code went away as well. So Google was offering this uh, hosting and uh, uh, development service for, for free. And essentially at some point they decided that they couldn't make money out of it, so decided to shut it down. So first they said, okay, you can no longer uh, push to your repositories. They are read-only. At some point they decided, well, you can still access your code, but they are just tarballs. You cannot access the history anymore. And at some point the service will just go out. I, I don't know if it's been shut down completely. Okay, and now it's been shut down completely. So, it's fine, they, it's their legitimate decision, but we might have lost something in the process. Um, so essentially the question is, you have services that archive other stuff. You have, for instance, the Internet Archive archiving web pages. Well, where do you go if a single GitHub, Git repository or a single Mercurial repository or an entire hosting place for software, for source code goes away? Where is the place where you go and find that? And I'm personally a researcher, so I'm kind of in computer science, and I'm kind of envious of my colleagues in physics, which are very good at essentially building shared uh, research infrastructure that they can use together. Think of the LHC, or think of the, uh, the big telescope in the Atacama Desert. Essentially, the, the physicist has been able to pool a huge amount of resources, build, build shared facilities, which are usually even uh, regulated by international agreements, and, where, and if you are a researcher, you can just pay for some time of using the resources, go there, do your experiment, and when you're done, someone else is going to use the same resources to do another experiment and do cool stuff with that. And as a computer scientist, I don't have that for source code. I dream of a place where I can go, maybe pay some cloud resources, and you do, do an experiment in doing a big grab on all the source code that have ever been published, see if my hypothesis is correct, and then you know, go write my paper, share my results, and someone else will just use the same resources without needing to recreate the same data set and the same infrastructure over and over and over again. So essentially, this answering these use cases is what we have been doing uh, at Software Heritage over the past couple of years. So the Software Heritage project is essentially a, a, a project with a mission of collecting, preserving, and sharing all the source code that has ever been published with the world and with anyone who needs to access it. So to be more precise, what we want to do is actually support different use cases. So we have this mission of collecting and preserving and sharing source code, and we do that for various reasons. The first one is preservation for preserving our technical knowledge and our cultural heritage. So we claim that source code, not binaries, but source code is part of the cultural heritage of humanity, and we do not want to lose it. Even if it were not used, useful for anything else, even just doing the preservation for preservation's sake would be something very valuable. But we want to do more. So essentially, we, we care about the research use case, which I've just described. So we want to enable researchers to just test their hypothesis on the entire body of, of, of the software commons very easily. Uh, we, we care about uh, education use cases. Essentially, if you have followed our computer science uh, curriculum, you notice that we are not as good in using ontologies as other disciplines are. We don't have you know, a place where we go and go through the evolution of the implementation techniques for specific algorithms. And we do that with pseudocode, but we don't have often reference to real code and how you know, techniques, heuristics, and optimization have evolved over time. So we believe that something like uh, a, a big corpus of source code can be the basis on which educators build these kind of ontologies for education purposes. And additionally, we also want to, to cater for some industrial use cases. Specifically, it's very hard for all the companies that are embedding uh, free software in their products to know which specific version of a library, of a snippet, or whatever, they have embedded in a product. 
say you have used some free software to cheat on, gas, on diesel emissions in your cars, how do you know which specific version of the library you've used to actually you know, recall your models from the market when someone uh, catch you for, for that reason? And so essentially what we can do if you have a huge corpus, you can give out essentially identifiers that identify precisely the version of source code you have shipped in any IT product. And we are doing that following some very uh, strong design principles, not at the tech level necessarily, but at the institutional and, uh, uh, and um, management level, if you want. So first of all, we are doing all this in an entirely, uh, following an entirely open approach. So we believe the mission is important enough for doing that entirely using free software. So essentially all the software we use for archiving, uh, rendering and preserving and researching on the code, it's entirely free software. And we are trying to use the, you know, the usual models we have learned from, from open source, collective, collaborative development, uh, open issue trackers, and so on and so forth. You know the deal, you have, doing, you have been doing that yourself for, for quite a while, I'm guessing. And also, we, we, we understand that this is something which is meant to, to exist in the very long term. So essentially we are doing everything we can to maximize the chances that nothing will be lost. So of course, at a, very, at a simple backup level, what you want to do is having as many copies as possible. So the idea is that there, we don't want to have a single copy that is under our control. We want to have a, a worldwide mirror network which is under control of different institutional entities which keep copies of the archive so that no single technical attack or no single even institutional attack or changes in laws that might make it difficult to do preservation will be enough to actually lose something. And also, we are creating this as a non-profit initiative. So not because for-profit initiatives are bad or anything, but because the goals of companies and corporations change much more quickly than the goal of non-profit organizations dedicated to a single mission do. So this is going to be, and forever, going to be a non-profit initiative. Um, so let me give you some more details of what we are doing. So essentially, we want to preserve source code together with the history of its development. So pretty much we want to be able to, people, to enable people to, uh, if a version control system or if you have a source package disappear, we want to enable them to reconstruct the full history of developments and restart development from that point. So what that means? It means that we go around looking for places where source code is either developed, forges, or distributed, package managers for instance. And we go there and we archive all the following information the content of all the source code files we find, the directory structure. So we want to be able to reconstruct a source code tree, essentially, at, the, at any point we have archived. Uh, we archive the, the, um, uh, the history of revisions. So we archive commits, all the metadata associated to commits. We archive releases, so the specific commits we have been tagged as being an important milestone in the project. And in addition, we store all crawling information. So where and when we have archived any one of those uh, different type of artifacts we found in the wild. And we do that using a data model which is agnostic. So essentially there is a single data model which is able to store the details of a Git repository, of a tarball, of a Debian source package, of a PyPy archive, or of a subversion uh, repository in a single data model. So that when people migrate to one VCS to another, you know, now they have Git, when they will migrate to something else, we will not have to you know, re-archive everything. Um, what we do not archive is essentially everything else, like we do not archive bug tracking systems, we do not archive code reviews, uh, mailing lists, uh, websites, and so on and so forth. Not because they are not important, we know they are very important for development purposes, but we feel that already the mission of archiving source code is quite challenging, so we do not want, at least at this, at this stage, to go through some sort of mission creep and stretch ourselves too thin. Still, what we are doing to play well with those archives is making it possible to pinpoint any artifact we have archived so that if others are doing, uh, well, if others are archiving those kind of things, they can easily do some cross-matching and say, hey, there was this project back in 2018 called Debian. Now we are in 3000, the project doesn't, doesn't exist anymore, but the mailing lists are archived there, the source code is archived there on Software Heritage, the discussions are archived elsewhere, and essentially do some, create some sort of uh, big Wikipedia of software. But for now, we are not focusing on doing that ourselves. Uh, in terms of uh, data flow, we are pretty much similar to a, a web crawler, but we start from a selected list, of, from a curated list of origins. So we have a semi-automated list in which you can say there is a forge there, 
which is of a specific type, or there is a package manager repository there of a specific type, and periodically we go through all these uh, distribution places. And for any single distribution places, we have, a compo we have a different components called listers that can list all the software origins that we can find there. For instance, for GitHub, it's something like something that can list all the Git repositories that are there. For Debian, it's something that can list all the packages that can be found there. And periodically, we redo this in some adaptive ways to avoid hammering the, uh, the, uh, the forge or the package manager repository. And we create a big list of software origins. Essentially, a software origin might be the URL of a specific Git repository or the name of a specific package in a, uh, in a package management repository. And we do essentially the same thing periodically on the origin themselves using different components, which are called loaders, which essentially go, th go visit those, so, those origins and find new stuff that we have never archived before. So essentially, with respect to the state of the archive, every time a loader visits a specific software origin, it will look at everything that is there. And in the case of a Git repository, it might mean all the blobs, all the comments, all the releases, and so on and so forth, compare with the state of the archive and archive everything that is new without removing any, every, anything of what has been archived in the past. Okay, so this is the idea. Um, and the data model itself is a big Merkle DAG. Okay, it's the uh, same data structure we'll find in, uh, in Git itself, in blockchains, and it's pretty popular these days. So I guess you cannot see much of the details in, with this projection, but essentially it's a, it's, a, it's a big Merkle structure in which we have leaves, which are just the content of the files without any name, identified by checksums. Okay? Uh, the primary key right now is still a SHA-1, but we have additional checksum to avoid collisions. Uh, you have another level, which are the directories themselves, and you go up, you have a level with the revisions, which are commits. You go up again, up to objects that we call snapshots, which are essentially the full state of a given repository or, uh, or source packages. So for instance, think of the case of Git. A snapshot of a Git repository is a, is a small picture in which we have for each branch, for each tag, uh, the object it's pointing to, and you take a picture of that and you store it. And what is, what, why this is interesting is that even if the Git repository is deleted or if you have changed the history in some destructive manner, doing rebase or deleting branches and so on and so forth, we never remove the old snapshots. Okay? So if you remove stuff, you, we can still have the picture of the repository before your removal. So you will be able to find stuff that maybe you deleted by mistakes. And, and the, at the leftmost part on the, of this picture, what we have is essentially the equivalent of a small calendar that for each software origin tells you when we have visited it. And for each timestamp when we visit it, points to a snapshot, which allows you to retrieve everything accessible from, uh, from that visit we did. Um, this is not theory, it's something that exists for real. It's been going on and it's been archiving stuff for the past couple of years. So we have already archived more, more than 5 billion unique source code files because we deduplicate everything thanks to the, the American structure. We have archived more than 1 billion unique commits coming from more than 80 million projects. So project is a kind of a vague term at this point, but say one, each Git repository is a project, each package is a project, and so on and so forth. So it covers GitHub itself. It covers Debian, uh, it covers GitLab, uh, in the main instance, so gitlab.com. And starting today, so we announced it for PyCon Affair, that it also covers PyPy. So we periodically archive all the packages that are on PyPy, looking, finding new version of, of, of packages pushed there, and we in integrate them in the, in the archive. Uh, we have also done some experiments, some one-off experiments. So we have archived the entire Gitorius archive, the entire Google Code archive, uh, thanks to collaboration with both the Internet Archive and Google itself. We have archived the one shot, the releases of the, the terrible releases of, the, of all GNU packages. And we're working on archiving Bitbucket. So it's already today the, the largest uh, source code archive that exists in, in the world. Uh, it's big, it's not that big compared you know, to video projects. It's something south of 200 terabytes in terms of raw content. And uh, the graph structure is in a database which is something like six terabytes. If you look at the graph itself, at a sort of conceptual computer science model, it's a big graph. So it's 10 billion nodes and more than 100 billion edges. So it's a pretty interesting beast, which is kind of challenging to, to deal with. And it's growing daily. So periodically, we, uh, we, we add new origins that we crawl. We add new loaders for new version control system or loaders that we crawl. And uh, you know, stuff gets published, and we archive it. 
Um, what can you do with this today? So there is a web API uh, that you can use to actually navigate through the graph. Okay, it's not a web, an API which is made to, uh, uh, to do some massive scale analysis of the, of the content of the archive, but starting from any point, so you can do stuff like, okay, tell me all the visits you have of a given origin, it will give you that, and it will allow you to grow through the graph, starting from the snapshot down to the individual file content. Um, you can find it documented at the uh, archives of the heritage.org uh, entry point, which is both for the um, web API itself and also for a, uh, a web navigation interface. Uh, and you can download stuff. So essentially the main use case here is, oh, my repository has been deleted for whatever reason. Can you, can you give me the entire state of the repository uh, at the last visit you, 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 you did of it? And the answer is yes. It's not practical to use the API to do that because you will have to you know, download every single object one by one, which is not really practical. So there is a service which is called the Software Heritage Vault in which you can say, okay, I'm interested in this snapshot or maybe in this directory that you have archived. Can you please bundle it up for me? Can you create a tarball for it? Or can you create a git bundle? And it will do that asynchronously. It will contact back. It will contact you back when it's done. You will be able to download either the tarball or for now the other format that is supported is a git bundle. And you can import the git bundle directly locally and restart development from there. And the last way we have opened up a few months ago for uh, navigating through is actually a, a proper web interface. So it's, if you're familiar with the Internet Archive uh, Wayback Machine, this is something which is very similar. So you start from the URL of your uh, software origin that you can find using some full text search thing on the URL itself. And it will show you a calendar saying, and actually we'll show you the last visit first, but you also have access to a calendar that show you every time we've visited it. And you, you pick a visit, and then you have a GitHub-like interface that allows you to navigate through the files, through the commits, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that too is accessible starting from archive.softwareheritage.org. And that's it for a general overview, and Nikolai Zappi will tell you more about the PyPy archival. Yes. So um, with Stefano, we've seen an overview of what Software Heritage does, and I'm going to drill down in some details of what we actually do. So if you remember the, da the data flow, uh, you have the software distributions, uh, the archive, and then a big mess in the middle, um, with um, uh, basically listers that create origins in the database, and then crawler loaders that will uh, load the origins. So in concrete terms, we're going to focus on what we're doing for the PyP um, distribution. Um, so the first step is actually listing all the Python modules that exist on the PyP archive. So uh, this is all uh, inside the SWH lister module, uh, which is Python as well. So what a software heritage lister does, basically it crawls and passes upstream APIs and turns that list of projects into um, origins that our loaders can understand and can work on. And it creates loading tasks that are fed into the scheduler mechanism uh, to actually load the contents of uh, the origins. So most of the credit goes to Avi Kelman, who did the lister scaffolding, so all the base uh, layers for the implementation, and Antoine Dumont, who actually did the PyPI uh, implementation. So uh, visiting the cheese shop is very simple. Uh, there's this simple API. Uh, you hit this endpoint, and you get a seven megabyte list of all the projects that exist on the uh, on the PyP. Uh, uh, according to the documentation, it's the only endpoint that's not going to be deprecated soon. So we're doing that. So it's really an HTML file with a list of links, and you follow these links, and you get uh, data about the projects. So in Software Heritage, uh, we turn those into an origin, which is basically a type and a URL 
for where we download the data. And a loading task, uh, which has a few items of metadata that I'm going to go into uh, in a moment. But basically, uh, you say that it's a PyPy origin, uh, which is called Django, and you can find uh, like the uh, user navigable uh, page is at pypi.org slash packages slash Django. And the metadata is in this JSON endpoint. And that's it. Uh, we feed that to uh, the next component in the tool chain. And we do it for all the PyP uh, modules, which is, I think, uh, yeah, 150K uh, modules. The scheduling, uh, so the next component in the chain is the scheduling of jobs. Uh, so this is, again, a Python module, uh, SWS scheduler. What does it do? So it records recurrent and one-shot tasks. So we can do tasks that we're going to do again and again. So for instance, uh, loading data from an origin, we're going to do uh, regularly uh, to make sure that we get updates from, uh, from upstreams. Um, so this is recorded in a database uh, with a very simple model, uh, a list of tasks, list of runs, and then that's it. Uh, there's a component that schedules the runs. So uh, it does simply, uh, is this job pending? It runs the job, etc. That's a really, really simple scheduler. It manages retries for transient job failures. Uh, for instance, if the internet is not available when we try to load, or if, um, I don't know, the upstream is throttling us, uh, we can retry uh, loading uh, and doing the job that we try to do. And it also manages adaptive intervals for recurring jobs. So the idea behind adaptive intervals is that we don't want to hit all uh, the dead projects on GitHub every day, because that's a waste of resources. So what we do is that uh, every time there's a change in a repository, uh, we're going to decrease the interval between jobs. And if there's no changes, we're going to increase the interval. And hopefully, in the end, uh, this ends up being a fairly stable uh, system where uh, very active uh, origins are being checked more often than dead origins that are being changed once every quarter or once every year. And that's it. So how do we do it? Uh, we build upon trusted Python tools. Uh, we, we use Celery uh, as the basically a task queuing middleware. Uh, and we use it for the worker management framework, which is almost reasonable. Uh, and basically, uh, we have Celery in the middle, and then we have a component that does the scheduling uh, from the database. And we have a component that listens to the Celery events socket and updates the database in the back end. Um, and then uh, we have uh, some kind of uh, batch job that archives uh, elapsed tasks and elapsed runs into an Elasticsearch uh, index so that we can keep the database uh, small and uh, like working. We're scheduling jobs, but what do these jobs do? Uh, and concretely, what does loading a Python package look like? So what's a Python source package anyway? Uh, a Python package, uh, you have two kinds of distributions that are uh, available in the, Py in the PyPI um, distribution. You have source distributions, SDISTs, which are basically tables or uh, zip files uh, containing the source code for the module. And you have binary distributions. Uh, these days, they're mostly wheels uh, that you either have um, if your module is pure Python, you can have universal wheels. If uh, your module has uh, well, uh, an extension, then you need to build it for a bunch of uh, targets. So Heritage is interested in source code, so we only look at SDISTs, uh, even though uh, we know that a lot of binary distributions for Python modules actually contain source code, we only look at source distributions. The current uh, format for SDISTs is unspecified. Uh, it's uh, implementation specified. Um, basically, you probably get a table, and maybe there's a setup.py somewhere. Uh, 
Uh, right now, I think Warehouse uh, does enforce that there's a package info inside the, um, the table uh, so that it can like, have some metadata about the project uh, and everything. So this package info is currently generated by these cities when you do setup.py uh, as this. Um, and at some point, hopefully, uh, PEP 5.1.7 will be implemented, uh, which is a build system independent format for source trees. So what PEP 5.1.7 does is basically uh, constrain and uh, make uh, machine readable all the metadata that's used for package specification and package building. So instead of a setup.py with arbitrary code, uh, you have a 2ML file uh, at the top level directory where you can actually have machine readable data about uh, your build system and your package and uh, all the metadata. Uh, so if you want this to happen, uh, the folks at the PyPA uh, are really uh, keen to getting some help actually pushing uh, this through. So uh, now that we know uh, pretty much how a uh, Python source package looks, uh, we can actually like load it into the Software Heritage Archive. So again, we have a specific module for loading PyPI packages. Um, this module builds upon uh, a template for loaders that does basically always the same thing. What it does is it goes to the origin, it looks at the metadata about current versions of the project, so in the case of a Git repository, you get the list of branches. Uh, in the case of a uh, PyP module, what you're gonna do is you hit the JSON API and you get list of versions. And for each version, you get a list of files that are available. Through these files, while we go through these files, we filter only the source distributions and we have this set of versions that are available for the package. What we do is then we look at the Software Heritage Archive and at the previous iteration of loading, and we do a diff basically between what we already have and what's new. Once we know that, we download and process all the versions that we didn't already have, and we load the new data into the archive. So it's very simple, uh, like there's nothing revolutionary about this. Uh, in specifically for the PyPI packages, uh, the upstream JSON endpoint gives us uh, digests for tables so that we know uh, we can check that we already have loaded the original table. And if there's a new publication of the same version but a different table, we're going to load it again so that if someone messes up and does a wrong release and then releases again with the same version number, we're gonna find it out and we're gonna archive the new version. Uh, what we do is we uh, pass and save the metadata from the package info file. And uh, there's a bunch of packages that have multiple sdists. Uh, for instance, some packages separate the documentation into a different sdist than the main code file. And we archive them all uh, in separate branches in our data model. So when we look at a snapshot, so if you remember in the data model, it's the topmost uh, like uh, object that we store in the archive. Uh, basically, we have an intrinsic identifier and a list of branches, which uh, are the releases, so the version numbers are available. And for each of those releases, we point to another object, which is currently a revision. Uh, technically, it should be a release, uh, as it's an actual release of the piece of software. This is just a limitation of the current data model. Uh, we're going to evolve it very soon. And then we have a pointer, uh, an alias for the default version. Uh, that's what the PyP API gives us. Uh, so you can have a development version, but you can still point to the default version uh, as a previous uh, release. And inside the revisions, so we store uh, usual data like offer dates, uh, committer date, uh, etc. Uh, we record that the type of thing that we imported was a table, um, and we point to a directory. So the directory is the root directory of the table, and then 
within that there's uh, all the data uh, that's been loaded. And what's specific about the PyPI loader is that in the metadata field, we pass the package info data. So we have the name of the project, the offer, uh, the summary with all the description, version number, etc., etc. Uh, the classifiers uh, from Trove. Uh, but we also store the original artifact, so the table that we've loaded. So we don't store the table itself. However, we store all the information uh, that we could gather about the table. And when doing a uh, comparison between uh, the previous loading and the current loading, we can use the SHA-256, which is published uh, from the PyP -P archive, to compare if we've actually loaded the same artifact or if we need to load it again. And just record that this has been synthesized by Software Heritage, so it's not something, it's not a revision that existed in a version control system, it's something that we've invented from some metadata that we've passed inside the data. And that's it. Um, we have... Uh, so, the next step is how, if you want, how to get involved in Software Heritage. So we have a roadmap of what we'd like to do uh, in the future. So currently we've done lookups by content hash. We have uh, browsing. Uh, so basically we have implemented the Wayback Machine for software source code. Uh, we've also started implementing stuff like depositing source code. Uh, for instance, uh, researchers, when they publish papers, they can attach source code. And this source code is being pushed by the archive into software heritage for long-term preservation. We also allow people to ask us to save code now. So now is a vague term. But basically, you go to the interface, you type a URL. If it's something that we already know, we can schedule the next run of loading. And if we don't, then there's a whitelisting process that your origin goes through before it gets loaded. And then at some point, uh, it's eventually consistent, you get your software archived. Um, and we still have a lot of very interesting and very challenging to-dos. Uh, provenance lookup for all the archive content, uh, full text search. Basically, the sky is the limit. You can do everything that you can imagine on the largest source code archive, uh, the largest source code corpus there is. Um, everything is just here. You just need to look at it. Uh, you can help. Uh, all our development process is open. You can go to forge.softwareheritage.org. It's our fabricator instance. Uh, you can join us on a mailing list on IRC. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that we want to crowdsource from the community. Uh, of course, the project needs uh, awareness, uh, but we also need to know about source code that's endangered. So if you know of a source code hosting place that's being shut down, uh, please add it to the suggestion box so we can try to get in touch with the admins and get a dump before uh, the code disappears. Um, and so we are not currently recruiting, but regularly we, uh, we expand our team. So if you're looking for jobs, for internships, uh, we have some internship positions open. Uh, you can have a look if you'd like. So Software Heritage, reference archive of all the available free software, uh, international, non-profit, mutualized infrastructure, accessible to all, and at the service of the community, at the service of society. So come in, we're open. Thank you. So we have ample time for questions. Uh, if you have some questions you want to ask, yes. So the question is, how do we deal with malware? Because, uh, yeah, there's malware everywhere. Uh, there's a lot of uh, like spam repositories on GitHub as well. Um, currently, we don't have a automatic process of removal uh, for this kind of uh, for these kinds of issues. Um, 
we do uh, respect the law and if there's something that needs to be taken down, uh, there's like processes to do so, uh, we don't do anything automatically and we don't want to put like processes in place that make a judgment on the value of code, uh, at least not automatically. Uh, we can decide if something is important or something is not important uh, and we don't want to. Uh, because we wouldn't know what people will use, what people will not use. Uh, do you have something yeah. maybe to add? I just wanted to add that, yes, so <laughs> what Nicola said, initially, from a research point of view, for instance, it might be very interesting to actually keep the malware around. So we really try not to judge, <laughs> <laughs> not to judge, but of course if it's legal for any reason and someone you know, sends a takedown notice, we will take it down. Learning. First one. <laughs> one by one. Like the infrastructure, who provides it, and do you have like guarantees that it's going to be provided like in the future? How how will it look? So essentially, uh, so the, the question is the infrastructure. Who is providing infrastructure, and do we have any guarantees that they will keep on providing infrastructure for essentially forever or for very long term? So we we have a bunch of sponsors. The the institution that started the project is INRIA, which is a national center in France for computer science. We also have a bunch of um, other for-profit sponsors or even the state. So essentially, there are no guarantees that will be around forever. What we're doing is essentially putting up the standard non-profit model in which we have a bunch of different ways of being funded and trying very hard not to have a single you know, sponsor that will kill the project if it goes away. We are growing organically, it's going pretty well for now, but essentially we are maximizing the chances the infrastructure will, will be here. Uh, you, had a, you had a second question, I think. So essentially, we are working on setting up a companion infrastructure, which essentially will be a mirror of the archive, and there is a generic. There is going to be a generic infrastructure for mirroring, and essentially there will be one or n mirrors, which are coupled to some uh, on-demand cloud, in which essentially a researcher will be just pay their. We don't want to, to pay the resources for you know uh, crunching the data for everyone. Essentially, you pay the resources you use, and the mirror is just a regular mirror. Right, so we, we have essentially a strategic plan of the project which is, uh, uh, which is available. Essentially, uh, we, we are potentially also interested in archiving you know, source code that is not public today but will eventually be. It's complicated from an uh, infrastructure point of view because you need to have different infrastructure that do not communicate or you might imagine people doing software escrow, so depositing source code for um, deals, with acquisition deals for instance, that kind of stuff. So it's on the roadmap, it's just that it's <coughs> was more urgent, urgent to actually archive public stuff and more easy to automate, so we started with that. In the future, we it probably we're going to do that as well, but not the focus of the time. So the question is, how about essentially automatically classifying and categorizing the software we have archived? Yes, so th there is a lot of research in the last year on essentially doing what is called big code analysis, doing machine learning on code, and yes, we're working on that as well. Uh, it's kind of challenging, at not much at this scale, but at this diversity, because given we archive all of GitHub, you have any kind of thing you can imagine, even stuff which is not strictly speaking software. So we are starting to work on that. Enabling other researchers to work on that too is, is, is a key part of that because we, we, you know, we do not have the, uh, the arrogance to think we can do everything ourselves. But so we are working in parallel on starting to do some of that. For instance, we are playing with uh, doing some uh, unsupervised machine learning on readme files and see what happens, see which kind of clusters of uh, uh, software projects you find. That's something we've been working on. But enabling other, anyone, any researcher in the world who will play on this would be a way to, to go in that direction. So apparently your input is for long term, so you have three thousand kind of things. Uh, the issue is that I can barely read French books written five hundred years ago. I'm completely unable to read Shakespeare, even though I can read uh, modern English books. So we'll have two issues with this in the year three thousand. We'll have a commit log in English, which will have become old English. And we'll have uh, source code written in Python and C. 
of Bailey able to read the little aura. You know, that's 20, 30 years old. So how useful exactly is it going to be in the year 3000 to have a huge database of stuff that almost nobody can read? read? Will we have we will have some kind of archaeologists or we will have people who study C as we study Latin today? <laughs> So the question is, does it make sense in 3000 to have archived uh, source code that maybe doesn't make sense at all in 3000, it doesn't make sense today? So actually, I think I have a different views of history than you have, because I think we're doing pretty good at you know, understanding Greek or cuneiform of that kind of stuff. So yes, I think I can imagine people studying C as they're studying you know, Egyptian today. So it's a very small question. But, but so essentially, the problem you're pointing out is that if, you are, if in 3000 we are going to have that problem, it means that we, not, maybe not us, but someone has succeeded in archiving that stuff. If you do not archive it, you would not even have the problem, and that's, would, we wouldn't be any better, I think. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <coughs> is there a way for me to grab that 500 gig hard drive that I don't use, plug it to my computer, and post a, a small fraction of the whole thing as a way to replicate it in some kind of security system? Uh, okay. So the question is, um, how would you be able to contribute uh, to the storage problem of storing the 200 terabytes of source code and, like? possibly ha having a chunk that's uh, stored uh, by people. Um, we're uh, not working on this currently, uh, but we're uh, looking into, uh, for instance, the Internet Ar Archive does something like this. Uh, they have an ea.back uh, project where the idea is that uh, you give a chunk of space and then uh, the Internet Archive can push data to your hard disk and basically that's one more copy. Um, and yes, I think that's something that we're going to look into in the future. Uh, and that's an easy way to like involve people uh, in the project and get more, uh, more awareness. So yes, that's... Uh, just a quick follow-up. So uh, we've been looking in briefly into IPFS like uh, mm -hmm. some time back, and you mentioned peer-to-peer -peer technologies. The problem is that those technologies are actually really good for distributing content, essentially democratizing CDNs, if you want, but they're not particularly good at guaranteeing archival. So imagine, for instance, having BitTorrent and wanting to have some guarantees that a movie is going to be available forever. That's usually not what this technology has been built for. So it's usually there is very hard to say, I want to guarantee that there are at least and copies of that, and you know, if they are not, someone is going to come up and get additional copies. They're usually not made for the kind of stuff. So essentially, you need to, as you guys was, build your own thing on top of those for making those guarantees. In, the, um, in my recollection, uh, the EA.back service really works well for large files. Uh, because you can chunk them and then it's really easy to keep track of how many copies of each chunk there is. Uh, currently we have 5 billion unique and things very that ones. and very, very small things. And keeping track of copies at this scale is already a challenge. Just like making sure that every single object has a set number of copies is hard already. So yeah, we have to work on strategies to actually bundle up objects and see what we can do. So the question is about how we deal with duplication of code uh, across uh, different origins uh, of the software. Uh, so the way we built the data model is uh, having full deduplication at every level. So every single level of the data model, contents, directories, revisions, etc., are all identified by intrinsic uh, cryptographic identifiers. And so uh, the duplication is free. Uh, because that's intrinsic to the data model. Uh, we've extended the Git data model 
uh, basically. And so if you do a fork of a repository on GitHub, and we see that you've, uh, you have a bunch of revisions that we already have, we're only going to download like the small increments that you've done, for instance, if you're doing a pull request or something. Uh, but we are going to keep uh, the data that was under uh, and that we have already. And even better than that, so if you have like 1,000 copies of a big Git repository like Linux.git, it's just you know a single pointer for yeah. every additional repository. Add. As long as they are, they are it's exactly the same state, it's just a single pointer to the same ID. It's fine, it's conference time. <laughs> Yeah, so unfortunately, yes, it has been already been asked. So the question is, which kind of funding do you have? So to just uh, a short answer is that it's, it's there's a big institu public institution that is funding this, which is UNRWA, plus sponsors. And the idea is to diversify funding as much as possible to avoid depending on a single uh, source of funds. It's, it's not a, a question, but a reflection. Uh, well, I today, what we do out of source code is pretty poor. We, we compile it, we execute it, and not much more. And maybe within 100 years or before, we can do much more out of source code, uh, like new ways to, to, to find what is uh, valuable there. And so it's a great idea of what you do. Thanks. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, the, about the, the DMCA takedown process, is there going to be a collaboration with, for example, with GitHub or, or other platforms when they get a takedown notice, they forward it to you because then and the second question uh, let me take this one first. So the first question is, is there any collaboration with platforms like GitHub for takedown notices? So the, the punk in me says that, that, what, what, that what you're suggesting is an anti-feature. <laughs> so I think we very much need not to have any kind of collaboration because, you know, the disease of, you know, overreaching copyright spreads. <laughs> so no, there is no collaboration. But we have looked in the ratio of takedowns they have, and it's actually not that much. It's a few hundred per year. So given we lag a little bit behind them, probably in most cases we don't even archive what it's taken down from there. But we're going to independently deal with takedown notices. And the safe code now feature is available for things that are at risk. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the safe code now feature is available. Actually, that's a very good example. Wink, so wink. Lo look, for instance, at how the Internet Archive is used for web pages. Usually, there is, you have some bad stuff on the home page of a politician. Well, you click Save Page Now, and then it's archived. So the politician is going to take it down from the original page, but then he needs to go through hoops to get it removed from the Internet Archive as well, if they really want to. So go ahead with the second question. The second question, the follow-up of uh, the question of how to participate in uh, well, uh, technologies that store looked at per keep, which is which used to be called uh, Camellia or something like that. Oh, um, I didn't know it changed name. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Apparently it changed names. And, uh, and there's a French project also, uh, Vidam, which is, uh, has also a lot of open source in it. Okay. Uh, so no, uh, so the question is, have, have we looked into a couple of technologies for essentially peer-to-peer -peer archival? And I'm not familiar with the second one. I'm familiar yeah. with the first one. Vidam is like a, a government project about uh, long long term storage of okay. data. Uh, I mean it has there's a bunch of public information about it. So I we think part of the source code is so we take note of that. We are in touch with some uh, French national archives for having mirrors there, essentially, or even offline periodic, I don't know, once per year dump in something which is off the grid and whatever. Uh, in general, if it is only, with quotes, peer-to-peer -peer technology, the same answer I gave before applies, which is usually not geared to guarantee archival, but we are definitely going to look into that and see how it's a good fit or not. What I suggest is that we go have yeah. coffee, maybe? Yeah, right. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll be around for coffee, so we probably should continue the conversation. Thank you.
Alright, done.